This time, let's study the Word of God with a sermon entitled, God's Word and Its Power. With this topic, let's learn the Word of God. You will be set high above all the nations. I'll make you the head, not the tail. Whose word is this? It is God's word, right? When God says something, it will surely be fulfilled. God's word has power to achieve all things. Let's believe that and depend on the word of God. Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. What is the characteristic of the Word of God? It is living and active. If God says something, there is always a response and a change. It is not dead. The Word of God is living. All the Word of God is fulfilled, completed and accomplished as it was given. To express that, the Bible said, the Word of God is living and active. We can have enough hope for our future with that Word alone, right? You will reign forever and ever. There is no more death, sorrow, pain, mourning and suffering. You will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Who said that? God did. Now we are in the process when the words of God are being fulfilled one after another. We should distinguish what was spoken by God from what was spoken by men. Let's take an example. When Jesus said to the robber on his right side, your sins are forgiven. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. What will the future of the robber on his right side be like? We don't need to worry about his future. Why is that? Because it must have happened according to the word of Jesus. How is the word of God? It is living. Once God says something, it happens. It's not something unresponsive or which will not be fulfilled. Let's engrave the word of Hebrews chapter 4 upon our hearts and see how powerful God's word is in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the Word of the Lord stands forever. And this is a word that was preached to you. Today, Mother has given the joyful and hopeful news to the children of Zion. Right before coming to this worship service, I heard that our members made speeches at the UN. The UN invited more than 750 university students. Among them, about 170 were our members from the organizations related to Zion. The UN selected who would make a speech as well as a respective topic. Four were chosen, and three out of the four speakers were our Zion family members. The UN liked their topics, so three of our members were chosen. 
the prophecy about the Lord's young adults, like the dew of the dawn, is in Psalm 110, right? The prophecy, the young adults, like the dew of the dawn, will be willing to work for God in the last days, is taking place. Truly, the Word of God is living and active. I can see that they are making the utmost efforts to preach the gospel in Samaria and to the end of the earth. More than anything, let us remember that God's Word is living, and so it will surely be fulfilled. God said, You will be the head, not the tail. Since these are also the living words, what will happen? Now the words are being fulfilled. Let us never lose hope for heaven, believing that every word of God will be fulfilled exactly. Let us always practice God's word while living on this earth. Through the history of Joshua, let's see how amazing the power of God's Word is. Let's take a look at Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6 verse 22 reads, Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, Go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her, in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, and brothers and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it, but they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute, with her family and all who belonged to her, because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. At that time Joshua pronounced this solemn oath. This was after Jericho fell. Cursed before the Lord is the man who undertakes to rebuild this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son will he lay its foundations, at the cost of his youngest, will he set up its gates? Joshua made a request and an oath, never rebuild Jericho. Whoever rebuilds it, he will lose his firstborn son when he lays its foundations, and his youngest when he sets up its gates. God made a prophecy. This prophecy was fulfilled in 1 Kings chapter 16. Let's see 1 Kings chapter 16 verse 32. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. In that age, Hayal of Bethel rebuilt Jericho, as we've just read, what did Joshua say about a person who rebuilds it? At the cost of his firstborn son will he lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest will he set up its gates. The prophecy was fulfilled exactly in verse 34. In Ahab's time, Hael of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segum, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua son of Nun. The word of God is living. Every word of God comes true. It happens and is achieved. We should remember that. All the words in the 66 books of the Bible are letters, but we must never think lightly of them. It's because all the words will be achieved exactly as they are written. The word spoken in the time of Joshua was fulfilled later, when a man named Hael rebuilt Jericho. He lost his firstborn son and his youngest son. Although there was a long time between the two events, 
God's prophecy was fulfilled. Remembering that the prophecy is fulfilled though it was spoken tens or hundreds of years before, we must regard every word of God as precious. We need to think about the meaning of the word of God and be mindful of its power and fear it with faith. Shouldn't we absolutely believe that the word of the living God will be surely fulfilled and accomplished? In the last age, the age of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit and the Bride, who are our Heavenly Father and Mother, have come to the earth. When we pay attention to their words and put them into practice, all of their teachings will be fulfilled. Their word is living and active. We must believe that. Two thousand years ago, God came to the earth in the flesh. At that time, He used the name of Jesus. Let's see what happened in that age and learn the power of God's word. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gethsemane, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Peter tried to catch fish all night, but he couldn't do it. Seeing Peter return empty-handed, Jesus said to him, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Peter replied to Jesus, We've let down the nets all night. We are experienced fishermen. But we haven't caught anything even though we've worked hard fishing all night. Jesus said, But still put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. What are these words? They are the living words of God. When Peter said, Even though we haven't caught anything, I will do that, relying on your words, and let down the nets. I don't know where such a number of fish came from. When they pulled the nets up, they caught such a large number of fish that their boats began to sink. Here, I'm not trying to discuss whether the amount of fish was a lot or a little. What is the characteristic of the words of God? They are living. Through this story, we all should realize that. At that time, Jesus did not appear as spirit, but in the flesh, and lived in Israel. He had ears, eyes, mouth, and a nose just like one of us. His life on this earth was recorded in the Gospel of Luke. Through the Gospels, we can discover that the Word of God is living and active. Let's go to John chapter 9. John chapter 9, verse 1. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming, when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground 
made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. What did Jesus say? Go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Let's see what happened by this word. Go, he told him. Wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Verse 9. Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened? They demanded. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Brothers and sisters, God 2,000 years ago and God in this age are the same God. He is the same God who divided the Red Sea in the days of Moses about 3,500 years ago. In this last age, the Spirit and the Bride are now saying, Whoever is thirsty, let him come. Whose voice is it? It is the Word of God, the voice of God, isn't it? There was a gracious history that the blind man could see when he washed in the pool of Siloam. Let us also take a look at what happened in the days of Moses about 3,500 years ago. Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21, verse 4. They traveled from Mount Or along the route to the Red Sea to go around to Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread. There is no water. And we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it. And what happens? Live. God said this. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, and what happened? He lived. The Bible teaches us the truth. That's why we say that all the words of God are the truth. In this scene, we can see the people experience the power of the living words of God. God said, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. If anyone who is bitten looks at it, he will surely live. As you've seen so far, all was fulfilled according to the words of God. God said, My word that goes out from my mouth will not return to me empty, but will accomplish. Didn't he? God told us that what he says will surely be fulfilled and that what he desires will surely be accomplished. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 13 and once again experience that the words of God are stern and alive through an event among the history of the kings. You all know this story very well. It's about an old prophet living in Bethel and a man of God. An old prophet living in Bethel heard that a man of God had come to Bethel and he wished to invite the man of God to his house. The old prophet prepared bread and water and invited the man of God. However, what did the man of God say? I have been told by the word of God, you must not eat bread or drink water there or return by the way you came. When the man of God delivered the will of God vocally, 
the old prophet from Bethel said, An angel said to me, by the word of God, When he comes, bring him to your house and treat him with bread and water. He lied to the man of God. The man of God thought, Is that so? And returned with him. And he ate bread and drank water. What was the result? Because the man of God did what God commanded him not to do. He was killed by having his body torn into pieces by a lion that he met on the road. This tragedy is recorded in 1 Kings chapter 13. Let's look at it in detail. Verse 11. Now, there was a certain old prophet living in Bethel, whose sons came and told him all that the man of God had done there that day. They also told their father what he had said to the king. Their father asked them, Which way did he go? And his son showed him which road the man of God from Judah had taken. So he said to his son, Saddle the donkey for me. And when they had saddled the donkey for him, he mounted it and rode after the man of God. He found him sitting under an oak tree and asked, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? I am, he replied. So the prophet said to him, Come home with me and eat. The man of God said, I cannot turn back and go with you, nor can I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. I have been told by the word of whom? By the word of God. I have been told by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water there or return by the way you came. The old prophet answered, I too am a prophet, as you are. And an angel said to me by the word of the Lord, Bring him back with you to your house, so that he may eat bread and drink water. But he was lying to him. So the man of God returned with him and ate and drank in his house. While they were sitting at the table, the word of the Lord came to the old prophet who had brought him back. He cried out to the man of God who had come from Judah. This is what the Lord says. You have defied the word of the Lord and have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. You came back and ate bread and drank water in the place where he told you not to eat or drink. Therefore your body will not be buried in the tomb of your fathers. When the man of God had finished eating and drinking, the prophet who had brought him back saddled his donkey for him. As he went on his way, a lion met him on the road and killed him, and his body was thrown down on the road, with both the donkey and the lion standing beside it. Some people who passed by saw the body thrown down there, with the lion standing beside the body, and they went and reported it in the city where the old prophet lived. Looking at the scene of 1 Kings chapter 13, we can confirm again that every word of God is living. We must never make any mistake in keeping God's commands whatsoever. Let's engrave this on our hearts. With such power in His Word, didn't God come to this earth and open the way of life to mankind? Let's see John chapter 6, verse 53. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. This is what God Himself said when He came in the flesh. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Verse 54. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has what? Has eternal life. You have eternal life. Who said this? God spoke this when He came to this earth in the flesh. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. God also said, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Whose words are these then? They are God's living words that must be fulfilled, right? Then what about those who do not obey the words? 
Can they have life or not? They can never share in the kingdom of God, nor enjoy eternal life. The words of our God are alive and active. Whatever God says has great power, whether He is in the flesh or in the spirit. If we do not accept God's word with faith, we end up disobeying it and being tempted to believe a lie like that of an old prophet in Bethel. The man of God ended up being miserably killed by a lion on his way back after finishing all the work that God had told him to do in Bethel because he disobeyed God's word. In this last age, God has come to this earth as the Spirit and the Bride. In Revelation chapter 22, what do the Spirit and the Bride tell us to do? The Spirit and the Bride say, What? Come. They say to all people around the world, Come. Those who obey these living words of God are coming to the Spirit and the Bride now. Among many churches in the world today, there is only one church where God the Father and God the Mother invite people to come. Which church is it? It is Zion, the World Mission Society Church of God, where we have come. No other church believes in God the Father and God the Mother. Every word from Heavenly Father and Mother is living. It is the word of life which must be fulfilled. Let us consider their words even more precious and obey their teachings, following them wherever they lead us. What then will our God do? What does Deuteronomy chapter 28 say? Let's see Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 1. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully what? Carefully follow all His commands I give you today. The Lord your God will do what? God will set you high above all the nations on earth. Every word God has given us is for us to be set high above all nations. Nevertheless, if we try to stray from the right path, stubbornly disobeying God's word, something ungracious will happen to us. Curses and disasters, not blessings, will overtake us. The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. Verse 2. All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you do what? If you obey the Lord your God. Only those who absolutely believe that God's word is alive can obey it. Is there anyone who doesn't want to be blessed by God? If there are some who do not want blessings, they must be the ones who disobey God's word. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed, and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. Doesn't it mean that God's blessings always accompany us wherever we are and whatever we do? Today I am delivering a sermon titled, God's Word and Its Power. God's Word is not something that we can choose to do or choose not to do. I feel God's immense grace by Him giving us His words. It is something that only God, who truly loves us, can do. Do you think that God came to this planet Earth, which is like a speck of dust, and gave us such a detailed explanation of all things, because there is nothing to do in the universe? God is giving us, who are on this planet Earth, His teachings in detail. So can we reject His words? 
Never. I earnestly ask you, children of heaven, to graciously follow all the words of God so that you can all enter the kingdom of heaven. I hope you received much grace through this sermon. Now let me conclude today's sermon. Thank you very much.